Welcome. It's National Quilter Circle, and we're live today with a, a project that is supposed to be a hint of fall. Whether you live in an area that feels like fall, maybe not quite yet, but it's coming. So Ode to Fall was an inspiration that um, I decided, okay, fall is going to come, whether it's 90 degrees outside or not, and let's have some fun with um, something that looks a little leafy. And I started looking through patterns and there are a lot of really traditional applique. I know I said the word applique, but hang with me. If you haven't done applique before, this is an easy version. This is my preferred version. So if you know me at all, I love the tricks and the tips to get through a project to make it look difficult, but have fun along the way. So Ode to Fall, as I looked all through all those very traditional patterns and saw a lot of traditional colorations. I thought, oh, let's let's go outside the box. Let's let's go past kind of that Civil War traditional orange and browns and and reds kind of thing, and let's have some fun with some batik fabrics. So I started going through my stash of fabrics, which probably you all have also, and I pulled out fabrics that looked like this. I had a batik piece that was. Um, when it was dyed, it has some um, kind of cheddar color, some orangey color, some pink, some kind of purpley plum colors, and it's in streaks across the fabric. And I thought, ooh, that would be fun to you. So that came out of my stash. And then I thought, okay, we could have a little fun with a little bit of green yet because we still have some green as the leaves change. So I found this that had some orangey kind of daisy print in it. And then I thought, well, when you look outside during the fall, what is it that sparks these colors? It's the blue sky. So we had to have a little bit of blue, something that kind of represented the sky. So I pulled my fabrics for my different shapes in my Ode to Fall. And then I thought, well, what am I going to put that on? That's a lot of color. And how can I make it pop? So a traditional black kind of tonal. It's not so solid black. It's a tonal black. But that way, all those colors would just pop right off of the pillow top. Now, this is the pillow top. You could frame it as a piece of artwork. You could um, decide to make more of them and make them as um, part of a wall hanging or a table topper simply make three of these, put them end to end, and you sim really quickly have a table topper. You could do them as part of a wall hanging possibly. So there are a lot of ways to take the, the suggestion of a pattern and make something else out of it. Now that you have the templates and you'll have the skills to do that really quick raw edge applique. So we have Corinne says um, hello from Raleigh, North Carolina. Wonderful. And Kelly says, hello from Arizona. We are glad that you're with us. Remember, drop in the comments. Tell me where you're watching from. Maybe fall doesn't really change the appearance outside where you live. Tell us where you're at so we can have an idea. And you can still have a lot of fun playing with fall kind of um, motif, coloration. So I've got my, my fabrics picked for this one. And... Um, after I got done thinking about the different shapes, because I wanted to do something leaf shaped, um, I was looking through a lot of different designs to get inspiration, a lot of different leaf shapes, and I um, came across the oak leaf. So I live in Iowa. Our state tree is the oak. My husband is a forester, and so trees are in, and the types of trees around us are very important to us. So the oak leaf was what came up, that big sturdy tree that changes in the fall and creates a lot of acorns, so the squirrels outside have a lot of fun. And then something to pull it together, kind of a wheel in the center to create that kind of a traditional um, applique look. A lot of times we'll have four main pieces in the corners, something to fill in here along the sides, and then a, a center of some sort, a, a circle, a, a star maybe kind of shape, or something like a wheel. And that's the design that I chose for the center of mine. I've got Melissa saying hello from Manchester, Kentucky. And Kathy says, good morning from Saskatch uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. We're glad you're here. It was one degree Celsius here to start with. Ooh, one degree Celsius means it was 32 degrees. I B 
believe if I've got my transition from Celsius to Fahrenheit, correct? So it's been cold up there. Wonderful. We're glad you've getting slammed into uh, almost into late fall already. Betty says, good morning from Mississippi. Uh, wonderful to have you here. And Joan says, hello from mm, Coltonsville, Illinois. Okay. So we've got kind of a big, we got the swath through from Texas or uh, uh, Saskatchewan, Canada, all the way down kind of through the Midwest. We've got a little bit of North Carolina there. We've got uh, the Mississippi. We're going into the South. Let's see if we can find some Californians, some people from Oregon or Washington. And where are my people from way up North? Maybe like, you know, Maine and those, they'll be popping in, I bet. Okay. We've got Lisa saying, good morning. Um, I love the design of the oak leaves and acorns um, from Little Shoot, Wisconsin. Wonderful. We are glad that you are joining us and we're going to have some fun with this. Now, it's funny is when I had this laying upstairs this morning as I looked at it and I was looking at the pattern, which you can download. The link for the pattern will be in the comment section. And if you don't download it, oh, we also have a QR code that you can just put your phone up and it'll take the link right to um, right to the pattern. Wonderful. I love that my moderator is right on the money. He knows when to jump in. So you can get the pattern there. And if you don't have it downloaded already, you can always rewatch the video when the QR code comes up. Put your phone over it and it'll capture that little image and take you right to the pattern. So once you look at the pattern, I was actually looking at it and I saw that the acorns, if you look at them, they look a little like a Christmas bell too. So maybe we could stretch this into even a Christmas kind of project. So it all is in that second that you look at something, what you see, and then maybe you can't see it later. Um, Dee says, hello from South Louisiana. Uh, Kathy says, uh, good morning from Northern Virginia and Tucson, Arizona. Wow, we've got you stretched across the country. And Michelle says, hello from Central Ohio. Wonderful. Now, the pattern will give you the overall, all the materials you need for the project. This is a small pillow. This is a 12 inch finished. I, it's more of a decorative pillow, maybe something you just bring out for the season and then maybe it goes back away which is easy to do because you could take the pillow out of the inside and then you'd have something very small to stash away. That's the nice thing about a lap back pillow is what I'm gonna teach you how to create today. You can take that insert out and use it in something else um, and then have less to store. So all of your fabrics, it will tell you how much of the background fabric, how much approximately for the leaves and the acorns in the center wheel. Um, a piece of fabric for the backing of this top portion if you, when you go to quilt it, if you want that backing fabric on it also, and the batting needed, how much you would maybe need for binding. If you want the binding to be a different fabric than the background, some people like to pick a binding that doesn't match the backing. So I usually list the binding separately. And then the templates that are included in your pattern. Now, when you go to print off your um, templates, there is a key in the corner that will tell you it's one inch by one inch to get them to this size. The biggest thing that you have to make sure is that when you go to print, don't have um, your computer do any alterations, have it print actual size. Now, if it's off by a little bit, it's still going to fit together. It'll be fine. It just might be a little bit smaller than what you see here in the overall size and the design. So, um, but make sure that you can see if you can make sure that it prints actual size. And then you can always double check by measuring that one inch square should actually measure one inch when you have it um, printed out. The other thing you will find in your pattern is an arrangement template like this. Now, this is what the original looks like for me because I'm in the designing process and trying to lay them all out. But I took a photo of this and shrunk it down so that you have an idea overall how the um, acorns are oriented, that the leaves are not perfectly symmetrical because symmetrical because no leaf is exact there are no two leaves that are exactly the same so if it's a little wonky that's okay that's part of the design in this process but you do have an arrangement page so that you know how to put the wheel in the center how the acorns are supposed to be arranged and the leaves out from that we have d saying hello from southern louisiana kathy from uh 
Oh, I already got that one. Sorry. And uh, Diana popped in and said hello from Texas. There we go. Trying to keep up with everybody that's joining us today. Okay, so once you get all of your basic supplies together, um, you're going to do just a little bit of cutting. So I've picked out some of those traditional fabrics also, just because some of you may not appreciate bright and, and obnoxious. <laughs> but um, so if you want to go more traditional, you can go to those kind of almost like Civil War type fabrics, um, that golden color that we see as the crops across the country start to turn um, the corn and the soybeans are starting to turn that golden color. And then I picked some Civil War reproduction fabrics that have that kind of autumn -y feel to them. And they come in a whole array of reds and rusts and greens and browns. And those are great fabrics also for doing those fall kinds of fabrics. Okay, let's see. Diana says hello. Another Diana has popped in and said good morning from Plain City, Ohio. Wonderful. We're glad you're here. Okay, within these fabrics, since that um, light um, beige tan, tan color is going to be my background, what you need to cut, and it tells you in your instructions that you're going to cut a 13 inch square. For the background we're cutting it a little bit bigger so that later you can go and size it up to the proper size but a 13 inch fat, um, square is going to be the background of your applique then you're going to cut two 12 and a half inch squares those are going to be used to create the lap back um, of your pillow on the back side okay so we'll do that towards the end so those 12 and a half inch squares there's two of them, keep them together, set those aside, don't get those mixed up with your background fabric. So we've got your background. We need to create all those appliques that go on to our pillow. The acorns, the oak leaf, and that center wheel that we're going to be using. Now, I'm using um, Heat and Bond Light. That happens to be my favorite fusible product. There are all kinds of other products on the market for doing um, fusible. So if you have a favorite, go ahead and pick that. Make sure you always follow your instructions for how long it needs to be heated and what your iron setting needs to be at. Because if you overheat the glue, the, tack, the um, portion of this product, the glue will be absorbed all the way into the fabric and then not leave anything else for you to put it onto your background fabric because we're gonna apply this first to our shapes, then to the background piece. So if you're brand new to applique, here we go. I'm gonna set my background fabric just aside for the moment. We are gonna kind of slide this out of the way. We'll bring him back in a minute. We are going to take our templates that you have, your templates, each of the templates has how many to cut within it. So cut four of the acorn, four of the leaf, and one of that center wheel. Now, I've made those kind of big and bold outlines so they're easy to see through um, the fusible product. So as you lay that over, this one has the glue on one side, a paper side on the other. There are other products out there. Some are double-sided paper, the glue tacky layer in between. And there are others that, um, out there also that just have the glue on one side, paper on the other. So follow their instructions. Um, I have already traced and cut out my wheel and my acorns. So I need to trace and cut out the leaves. In this case, you really don't need to worry about reversing anything because um, I've already kind of prepared it so that yours will turn out similar to mine. And since leaves, like I said, no two are exactly the same, there's no need to do a reverse image. Sometimes we need to reverse, say in the case of letters, so that we can read them properly or check to see if they have been reversed before cutting. Just make sure you read your instructions with other patterns if you haven't used um, I haven't done very much applique before. Now, I'm going to kind of arrange as I trace onto the paper side of my fusible. I'm arranging this so I don't waste too much of my product. They don't have to be neat and tidy and nice little rows because we're going to cut this out and apply it to the back side of our leaf fabric. And 
using up as much of the product as possible without wasting any is always kind of, it's one of those challenges. If, if you like puzzles, it's kind of rearranging them. See how I'm just kind of nesting them together as I'm tracing out four of the leaves. So I'll have not a big, huge wasted space of fusible. There's always gonna be some waste but trying to reduce it as much as possible. So of those of you watching, if you've never done an, any kind of applique or raw edge applique before, this is kind of an easy start because the shapes are very, they're pretty forgiving. Yes, there's gonna be some stitching around the shapes at the end, but the method that I'm going to use is kind of a, a clean, easy. You don't have to have a machine that does any fancy stitches. Um, when I first started quilting, I did not have a sewing machine that did a blanket stitch. It did not do a feather stitch. It didn't do, it did zigzag and a straight stitch. That was all that machine could do. And it was a wonderful machine, but it just didn't have any extras added on. So this is designed so you don't need to have any fancy stitches. You can just use a straight stitch. Okay, so I've traced four of those shapes onto my fusible material on the paper side. And now I'm going to go and I'm just going to bubble cut. And I use that term in my patterns. Bubble cut means just to chunk it out. We're not cutting anything exact right now. We're just cutting it away from the rest of the material of the fusible so it's not in the way so we have I'm gonna bubble cut it like that so it's just chunked out now depending on the piece of fabric that you're going to be using if you were happen to be using scraps that are smaller maybe they're just the width of or the length of the leaf you may have to cut, bubble cut them apart in order to get them fused down this has been used before, so I have a, a cut into the fabric. So I'm just going to lay it along one edge here. And we're going to move it to the iron. Now make sure that you, like I said, I'm going to set my iron. Just My iron has cooled a little. It's, it's set one down from cotton so that I don't overheat my fusible. Bring my fabric over to the ironing surface. And I'm going to get it. Nice and flat first. It doesn't need to be starched or anything. We don't really want any extra product on the fibers before we put our fusible down, but I just want the wrinkles out so I get a good fuse. And then I'm gonna position my leaves in enough space to cover the whole. If I wanna put all the leaves down at once, I could cut them apart and put them kind of dancing in a straight line if I want, but I am going to leave them all connected here. It really won't matter that they are, the print of the design kind of dances across it. If you happen to have a specific stripe to it or something that's very, very noticeable, you can, if you like, orient them all in the same direction, but it's not required. Remember, we're having fun today. We are not going to be overly worried about things. Um, Dora says hello from Gabriola Island, British Columbia. Lucky says Diana in Fort Worth, Texas. Hello to all. And Deb says good morning from hmm, Iowa. <laughs> you are someplace in the state where I am. And Brigitte says hello from France. We've got our international quilter with us. Yes. I love it that our community can stretch across the ocean, across cultures, and have a connection that we all enjoy the same artistry. Okay. Whenever I tried to do art that had anything to do with paint, everything got messy. But when I got to fabric, everything's so much easier because everything stays nice and clean in one spot. Because as you cut fabrics, you get specific puzzle pieces to put together. Now, I'm just gonna cut these apart because um, it's much easier to maneuver a smaller piece when you're trying to cut around the fun shape of the leaf. 
So we've got someone, uh, Diane says hello from Washington, uh, Spokane, Washington. Uh, Michelle who says good morning from Maryland. Yay, we're glad you're here. Okay, now all that bubble cutting and your tracing may not have been perfect, but here's where you wanna make a clean cut. You want to take your scissors and I'm using a long blade scissors instead of the short blade. And it does help to make a smooth cut if you're using a longer blade because you're focusing on the line that you're trying to create and you can just maneuver the leaf shape back and forth as you make one long cut and your cutting will actually be smoother if it's done like that instead of short little snips you get less elbows in your cutting if you're trying to get that smooth appearance of the edge Maybe the leaf needs to look a little crunched. It's okay if it has some elbows to it, but that's just another approach. So the oak leaf, there are many different kinds of oak leaves out there. This looks a little bit more like, hmm, I'll probably bit misquote. I wanna say a bur oak, but I don't think that's right. If my husband was here, he would tell us the specific type of oak tree. When I was growing up, I thought, oh, all oak trees were the same. <laughs> Little did I know that there, the oak family is very large and has many members. Oh, that's a little like our quilt community. Okay, here we go. There is an oak leaf ready to go. So we have one. Then you would go proceed and cut all four of your leaves out. And then we're going to get into the portion of um, arranging them on our background. So we're going to take, take that back, that 13 inch square, and we're going to just do a light press on this. I'm going to fold it in half. It doesn't matter if it's right size together or wrong size together. We're just looking for some registration kind of places on the, on the fabric. So just a light press on those folds. And then I'm going to do one more fold. I'm going to fold this is the folded edge here. We've got a folded edge here. One more. We're going to do it like we're making a snowflake. Remember paper snowflakes? We're going to do one more fold to get that diagonal out into the corners. You kind of want to know where this line is and where this line is, like a big X across. You could mark it with a ruler if you'd like, but like I said, this is not an exact science today. We're just having some fun with our um, shapes and putting them together. Now, when I open it up, you can see my, see my nice little crinkles on there. Okay. Now it comes down to arranging pieces. So I've got my acorns, my, at least one of my leaves. I don't think you want to stand, sit there and watch me cut out all those leaves, but here is the wheel where I was using a stripe and I did line up the stripe down through the wheel so it does have kind of an orientation to it so i may lay that up and down the idea is that there are eight points on the wheel there are eight registration folds that you created so if you have two of them that are across from each other the spokes aligned with the center fold and the center fold you will have it centered you won't have to worry about where the center underneath is so that is in place then the acorns and in order to remove the paper backing i did that one without even thinking that if you haven't done this before you have that paper backing on your shapes so all you need to do is do a little fold and you'll notice that the paper starts to to separate itself from the backing and then you just peel it off and you'll see on the back Yep, you can see the shiny. That's the glue that you're going to use to adhere to the background fabric. Okay, we said we've got somebody from the Czech Republic with us. Yay! Um, I don't know if I can say your name right, Mirka. I think is how it is pronounced. Possibly it has an accent that I don't have in the Midwest. Sorry, but you or she's saying they're saying hello and good afternoon from the Czech Republic in Europe. Wonderful. We're glad you're here. Okay, so that, that tacky, the glue side that's, that you've created is going to go toward the fabric. So again, 
that's this is the reason why I love to use heat and bond light. Um, it's very easy. It does, and this is the light version so that it can be sewn through. Remember, there are products out there that have a warning on them that say no sew. It has a usually has a red circle with a slash through it over the top of a sewing machine. And it says no means no sew. You don't want to sew through those. And I can tell you from experience. Don't try to sew through it because I've tried. Didn't realize what I had picked up at the time. I was in a hurry to do something for the holidays. I picked up the no sew, used it, didn't realize there was a difference in it and how much glue base there was going to be. Put it under my sewing machine and it gummed up the needle. Every two stitches, it would break thread. And I couldn't figure out what the problem was until I looked at the packaging. No sew means no sew. <laughs> Don't try to sew through that. So make sure when you're purchasing, if you have not purchased in the past, that no sew product is for literally, it will stick, does not have to be sewn around the edges to, to keep the shapes in place. Okay. You could use that if you're making a wall hanging or something that's not going to be washed much. Um, it, the outside edge wouldn't have any stitching to it. And as quilters, we kind of like to do that edging, but it's up to you. But otherwise, use the No Sew brand. Okay, we've got Cindy who says hello from Texas. We are Texans awake today. Okay, now we're down to the leaves. So again, peeling this off. If you're as old as I am, you probably remember the days of a iron-on patch for blue jeans. My mother tried. My brothers would ruin every one of them. But this is what we're kind of creating is something that's an iron-on piece of fabric now. So if you haven't used this before, it's it can be kind of fun to um, play with. Okay, the leaves are going to go out. We're going to put um, the stem underneath of the wheel there and have it go out to the corner, kind of following that fold line. The acorns, your choice, whether or not you put them under the edge of the wheel or on top. In this case, I'm trying to remember what I did. I did put the tips underneath. So all of the tips of the shapes and the outer edge are under the wheel so that that blue would come out to the same distance and stay a consistent shape all the way around. So by just um, lifting the tip of that wheel, you can put the acorn, just the tip of the acorn underneath. That way you kind of know how far under to put it when, you, when the edges, outer edges kind of match up. And then it's shifting this to the ironing surface in order to, or create this on your ironing board. I was trying to keep this easier for you to see by keeping it centered, but we're going to slide this over. Oh, that didn't shift too much. Okay. I'm going to adhere these down so that we can talk about the stitching process that we're going to use that doesn't require any fancy stitches out there. Okay, Patty says hello from Washington. Wonderful, we're glad you're here with us. The acorns, remember the, the little top that looks like the, um, the stem of the acorn, kind of center that on that, um, that fold so that it's outer. I'm gonna leave some of my tips here just a little so that I can put my remaining leaves underneath. We'll get these fused just enough so that we can talk about the stitching process. Here, everybody's adhered. We just need three more leaves to finish this one out. Now, they are they are adhered. There's, I mean, this kind of light, but it's not, it doesn't have to be overly heated in order to stay in place. What we're going to be doing is a stitching that's an outline stitching. And let me see if I can get my camera in here. Um, we've got... I can't, I can't pronounce the name. Abrex from Oklahoma, I believe. I'm sorry, I'm not too good. <laughs> my bifocals are stretching for the distance to see my um, computer screen, so we have enough room here to work. We are glad that you're here. And I lived in Oklahoma for a while, so welcome. Um, we are going to do an outlining stitch. In the pattern, you have a close-up of the straight stitching that I did around about an eighth of an inch from the outer edge. Now, it's not perfectly consistent an eighth of an inch all the way around, close counts, okay? So let's see, in the pattern, I can show you really quick. 
there is a close-up shot that will show you that stitching that I did to, to kind of secure the outer edge. And it's not off the edge, it's just parallel to that outer edge. And when it comes to deciding um, how, uh, what thread to pick, um, do I layer this? Yes. Um, I put my, I just pretended this was my mini quilt at this point. So I cut a piece of batting that, um, I think it requires like a 13 inch square of batting for underneath. I also have listed in the instruction or the materials, there is something called a backing for quilted top, which means that I made a quilt sandwich. I'd put a, just a, any piece of fabric on the back. It could be just a simple white, um, an unbleached muslin kind of fabric on the back. It's never going to be seen because it's going to be inside your pillow. I have at times just use the back batting layer and not a backing but if this is ever going to be laundered at some point having that extra fabric on the back does keep the batting from um, getting fuzzed up and and destroyed so um, make your quilt sandwich your patchwork top your batting and backing i prefer to use just a quick um, basting spray and this is by sulky kk2000 it's washable. It doesn't have an extremely um, uh, strong scent to it. But if you object to any kind of spray fusible in your workroom, that's fine. Just do a simple basting um, by hand, or you can pin baste around. You could pin baste on the outer edges here so that the pins won't um, be in the way when it comes to the stitching portion. When it comes to what thread color to use, on something like this, I would probably just use a very simple kind of a golden color thread so that it doesn't um, doesn't scream away uh, any kind of uh, like black or something really bright. I would maybe even use an olive green on the green pieces and maybe go to that golden on the acorn. Your choice always on what color thread you use for the App, uh, doing the applique portion. Now, when it comes to something like this, where you have so many colors that you have kind of no idea where to start with color, I went to my stash of threads and I found a variegated thread that has reds, oranges, and yellows in it. It does not contain green, it does not contain blue, but when I did a little what I usually do is take the thread and I take a bunch off and I puddle it over my fabrics. It didn't scream at me. So this is a 60 weight thread. It's very fine. It's 100% polyester. 60 weight is a finer thread. That means that 60 threads could fit through the eye of a needle together. So that means it's tiny, tiny thread, which then just kind of melts into the background and you don't see a lot of thread on the blue and you don't see a lot of thread on the green and it just gives the edge the texture of pulling it down a bit but it doesn't and holding it in place but it doesn't um, have a lot of objection to the eye when you see the overall finished product so i set my machine for um the stitch length was at a two uh I'm trying to remember if it was 2.0 or if i give you the stitch length real quick um, I think I had it down to like a 1.8 is what I took it down to a little bit shorter stitch length so that I could maneuver those curves and go very slow as I was approaching each of the curves. So let me cut the batting piece here away so that I have something to lay under the machine and show you approximately the speed at which I'm barely sewing, okay? I won't put a batting or a backing piece on this today, but um, like I said, that would, I have done this before without backing, so it, it's really a quilter's choice on how they want to approach it. I'm going to do just a little bit of spray baste underneath, just a tiny bit. Doesn't take very much to hold it in place. 
I usually have my batting laying down because gravity takes any overspray mist and pulls it down. So therefore I don't have a lot in the air. There we go. Just enough to hold them together as one. And then taking it over to the machine. Now, depending on which um, presser foot you want to have on your machine, um, you can use an open toe foot so that you can see the edge of the fabric. Mine is fairly open in the front. It has kind of a clear plastic area so that I can go very um, close to the edge and I can see where I'm stitching at. Now, pulling threads to the back is always the kind of the best thing to do with the start and stop. So I want to have kind of a long tail of, of thread so that I can tie off my threads underneath. Let me get a little bit of thread started. A lot of times as quilters, we you know have that super short little tail. Here I'm kind of keeping a longer tail so that I, like I said, I can pull my thread to the back when I'm finished and I can knot the fabric on the back. And you take my stitch length down, like I said, to about a 1.8. And then I'm going to do that really slow stitching along that edge. This is not jackrabbit race. This is the tortoise portion of the race. And you can do this with the regular foot. You don't need to change to a walking foot. You, uh, if you'd like to, you can. Sometimes visibility on a walking foot is a little bit tougher for some people, but this is literally how I stitched. I'm down in the crease of that acorn leaf and I'm just taking a stitch across, a couple of stitches to get back out, and then back up the next lobe of the acorn leaf. So it's a very slow, meticulous kind of stitching, very rhythmic, but not a race. So we're constantly adjusting to keep really close to that cut edge. I'm not, I have red thread in here, so we'll see if that's enough for you to see the stitching. Okay. And then again, once I finish the shape, and at, what I usually try to do is do as much stitching as, at once as I can. So if I could possibly get all the way around everything, that would be fabulous. But sometimes we have to start and stop but leaving those long tails so that from the back side, I can tug on the bottom thread or the bobbin thread, pull the top thread to the back. There are times when we do back stitch, but then that builds up the thread on the front of the project. And we don't always want to see a buildup of thread. So I'm pulling my back thread, my bobbin thread and my top thread to the back putting them together and doing a knot, a loop, pull through, holding onto the tails. I'm pulling that all the way down to the base of the fabric and pulling on it so my knot is right up against where it came through my fabric. So I can show you really quick. I've pulled that thread up through, tied off the knot, then I can snip my tails and have it nice and clean on the back. Let's see if, on my design board here, I can hold this up. I'm not sure if you can catch. That's the funny part. Even a red thread on a dark green, you think you would be able to see. But I have done around the curve here and around the curve there. So I'm not sure if it, you can pick up maybe some of it there. Okay. Once that quilt, that stitching is done, then I went back and it's quilter's choice on what you want to do for the rest of the quilting of this project. The leaves are small enough. They do not need to have extra quilting in, um, included unless you would like to do that. Um, I did an echo all the way around. I did very, I did within an eighth of an inch of each of the shapes and then kept going in an echo form outside of that. And I think you can kind of see the shape there. I probably went half an inch or so in repeat, kind of, kind of a reverberation, almost like when you throw a stone in the pond, you get that ripple effect out from the, from the shape. So that's how I quilted all the way to the outer edge. Once that portion is done, you can cut your um, top to 12 and a half because that's we're going to be finishing it. Then it's creating the back, so the lap back, fairly straightforward. 
in your instructions, it will tell you how much to turn under. So let's see, I got to remember what I did. I've got two squares. They're going to be the lap back. So on each of them, you're going to turn under, let's see, under a half an inch all along one, one edge, and then you're going to turn it three inches. And I have a ruler, so I'll see if I can get close to three inches. Oh, not quite enough. There we go. Measure that, press, and then once you get that aligned properly, you've got your half inch turned under and then your three inch. Stitch along this with a matching thread. Do the same on the second piece, under half an inch, toward the wrong side of the fabric. If you've never done lap back before, then the three inch. So using your ruler to get three inches. It's not absolutely perfect. It's close. <laughs> three inches there. And then let's get this out of the way. We're going to pretend or say that we have this cut at 12 and a half. Then you're going to align the backing right side up with the folded hemmed portion toward the, the center of the pillow. The second one right side up and they will align now with the outer edge because you have trimmed your pillow down to the 12 and a half. So they will all align on the outer edge and then go to the machine and base the overlap area because you've got a lot of layers here. You can base all the way around the outside if you like. Basting is within the, there's a quarter inch seam allowance on the outer edge all the way around we're going to use to put our binding on. So stitch between that quarter inch and the outer edge at some point all the way around and that will hold all your layers together. And then because this will be trimmed, you're going to just apply binding to your pillow as if it was a regular quilt. So apply binding to the front, then roll it to the back and hand stitch along the outer edge and your pillow is ready to go. The nice part about using that binding is the, almost like a piping on the outer edge, is that your pillow is assembled. You can see everything when you're putting your binding on. You don't have to worry about turning it and aligning anything. You've got it lined up as a sandwich. Putting the binding on the outer edge gives it that kind of a piping to the outer edge of your ode to fall pillow. So, um, I don't think we have too many questions that came in today. I'm really glad that all of you joined me, whether or not you like traditional fall or you want to put a little pizzazz in your ode to fall. Thanks for joining me. We will be, be, I'll be back in a couple weeks. I've got a project that sat for a long time and finally got finished that I'll be bringing you. So join me in two weeks for our next live event.